Good evening, Bill. Good evening. Wait, it's still somewhat light where you are. Is that, I guess it's evening. I guess we can say that. We can say good evening. Yep. Uh, nice to see you. I've missed you again. I know. It's been two weeks. And it shall be two weeks again. You are going to Puerto <sighs> Rico next week. I am going to Puerto Rico for work, not for fun. And, and I'm going to parents' evening in case anybody cares. So I wouldn't have been able to make it anyway. It's funny, whenever you say that, it almost, at the beginning, it sounds like you're going to Paris, you know, but. <laughs> Unfortunately not. There shall be no Champs-Élysées for me next Thursday. It will be year eight parents it's... asking me a variety of questions about the artistic aptitude of their children. Um, anyway, this evening, we're talking about an interesting balance. Okay. So the reason why I called it an interesting balance is actually part of a quote that comes from one of the painters we're going to speak about this evening. Um, and all the painters we are going to talk about are what I think of as contemporary painters who are working now. Um, and the, the balance I speak of, though it was a quote from a painter very specifically about her work, I'm very interested in the relationship between painting and photography, as you know, mm -hmm. um, and also how one feeds into the other. So, yep. you know, traditionally, and we've talked many times now over the course of all our um, meetings about the, the references that photographs have yep. to paintings or within painting or painting history. Yeah, and how much paintings changed when photography came around. Yes, and I think the selection of paintings we've got tonight, we've got four paintings to talk about, and each of them has what I would think of maybe as a kind of photographic element there's something that goes beyond both photography and painting in the kind of 20th century paradigm. And of course it would, because none of them are um, 20th century, they're all 21st century. So first of all. Um, I, I would like to say that I know none of these paintings, I don't think. So I'm coming in totally blind as the blind portrait number seven says. So, I mean, I'm coming in relatively blind as well, actually, because although I've, I know the, the paintings and I use them frequently in my teaching, the artists, as I said, because they're contemporary artists, there's not a whole backlog of information about them. There's not a lot of anecdotal evidence available about them. In fact, it's likely that perhaps should I approach some of them, I may even get a chance to, to speak to them direct. So they are living, they're working now. Um, I think... I pronounce this Daniel Coves. He's from uh, Madrid, living in Berlin. Uh, the reason I know his work is because in 2017, he was uh, part of the BP Portrait Prize Award that we okay. have here at the National Portrait Gallery every year. The painting version of the Taylor Wessing Prize. Yes. Um, I love it that you say it that way around because most people always think that the Taylor Wessing Prize is the BP Portrait Prize for photographers. But, um, well, I don't know about painting, so I go the other direction. Go ahead. Um, so I'm telling you this is a painting and I, I kind of wish I hadn't actually because I, although I think the quality of my slide is maybe quite poor as a reproduction, I do wonder how long it would take a glancing eye to register that this is a painting. Yeah, it could be it could be a dreamy or affected photograph. Mm. What do you think, Bill? I you know I always I always wonder just from a technical point of view, you can almost tell, or at least I think that I can tell paintings that are made from photographs versus made from real life. Mm -hmm. I feel like if you're if you're making a painting from real life, if somebody is sitting for you you know, you're moving slightly, they're moving slightly. So there's like a, an averaging that happens uh, in, in, in the subject. Um, and it, it's almost like you took, you know, a hundred photographs and just laid them on top of each other and merged them together. And so what you get is very different than if you have a painter who's working off of a single photograph. I think mm. it's, I think it's a, I think it is a different end result. Um, and I, there's something about the quality of light that people generally don't do if they're shooting from light, whether if they're painting from life, that they do do when they're painting from a photograph. Maybe it's just because they can obsess about the little way that light sits on a hand or that kind of thing. Like even just the shading in the hand just feels very photographic. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's man, a lot of negative space in this guy, huh? Yeah, I, I mean the, the the painting that was in the portrait prize was a young man with his back to us. So all of the the portraits really are in some way obscured. Uh, I find it interesting that in terms of how others talk about this artist, they describe his work as something related to cinema in some way. I'm not hmm. sure I always get that. There, there is a painting or a couple of paintings where the back is turned to us and the, the model is in a wider scene. So where you're commenting on the negative space in this, there are a yeah. couple of paintings in which we have a kind of, um, a, a, what I think of as a wider scene and interior. Uh, one is in a kitchen and then there's another one that's by a, a door it's kind of haunting it's quite Gregory Crudson-esque you're not quite sure, sure what's what's been going on in a painting like this where there's that softness though I, I don't I don't get an element of menace in any way and again some people do talk about this idea that through obscuring the face there's a sense of menace and unknowing and and I again find that quite bizarre because not knowing is absolutely fine as you know <laughs> for me uh it's interesting I, I don't i don't see it as like in the sense that they're hiding something mm -hmm. that, 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 it's funny i i didn't even think about it that way you know that oh maybe this person is maybe their face is just deformed or maybe they're you know what i mean they they have their back turned because they're holding a knife or you know any sort of sort of, i just saw it as and maybe I'm thinking about it in a very photographic form, which is, you know, just turn I'm, away from I'm you interested second. that you're thinking of this in a photographic form. Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and so I, I, in, some, in some ways, I see the painting of it as a translation of the photograph, not as an original work. So this painting is directly informed by photography, you would say? Uh, I'd be very surprised if it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, th there may have been more stuff in the frame, you know, um, but I do you, mean, do you know for a fact? No, I don't. The answers to these. Oh, okay. No, I'm, I'm just, we're just inquiring about this really, because as yeah. I said, there's, there's actually not that much information about any of the artists. I think probably Agnes Toth is coming up later. She's probably the one who's got the, certainly in the UK anyway, she's got, a relatively big presence and she's done a lot of interviews um I, I mean for somebody who has been part of the bp prize portrait prize there isn't so much really to find um about daniel covers i'm interested also again we've said about this idea the references between painting and photography that photographs that look like this have been inspired by paintings earlier so there's a kind of weaving in and out perhaps of sure I, I think I think a lot of photography I mean I I can definitely speak for myself where you know if, if my end result of some portrait I take feels like a painting that's a big win for me hmm. well I remember um, that when I first interviewed you about your work yeah, I, I, I mean, it's funny because in some ways I'm, I'm discounting a lot of the things that photography is good at, which is stopping time and stopping motion and action and all those things, which mm. are, it's very rarely that I ever shoot somebody who's moving other than the dance stuff. I'm almost, I, I'm almost always, you know, this is what's in front of me and I'm going to take a moment to capture it. But it's, it's rarely that, that, so I could effectively be a painter. I'm just a really crappy painter. So I can't draw, so I use a camera. Um, but 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 it's definitely, yeah, that like, you know, I'm trying to make my stuff look like Sergeant and Caravaggio, where this guy, there's there's a, there's a there's a photographer that I have been obsessed with on Instagram, which you should look up at some point, named Mike Carson, mm. who paints from photographs but they look like they're like multi-layered stuff but they're very definitely painted from photographs you know um i it, it but it is interesting it's like yeah that this painting is definitely not in his mind i feel like it's there's something about the way the cloth is and everything it's just something you wouldn't do if you were just painting from paint unless well, you just there's had a, that kind of brain. really especially with art teaching 
you know, you say to students, I want you to draw from primary source. I want you to draw from life. Yep. And there's a, a kind of sense of almost it's like a dirty secret if somebody's made a drawing from a photograph. Yeah. And that has maybe changed. Oh, I think that. it's way more common than anybody wants to say. Well, yes, it is. Of course it is. But I also wonder if it's kind of entered a much more mainstream painting language or drawing language now because and it, and acceptability too. Are so... say that again bill and, and acceptability too yeah so before even when i started teaching sort of 20 years ago 23 years ago that was you know a, a, that was really not a thing we ought to be doing was was copying from photographs or tracing even you know shame of all shames right the photograph now is, you know, it's ubiquitous. It has its own language, of course, but it's also so much more acceptable, as you're saying, to to use it to directly create what then becomes a painted or a drawn outcome. Um, and the stigma around that is kind of going a little bit both in terms of teaching, but also in terms of just, I think, more widely in the contemporary painting. I, sometimes I'm fascinated. Do you ever see when they show people freehand drawing things that end up being photorealistic you know it'll be like a crushed coke can and they'll put it down next to them and on a piece of paper they just draw with colored pencils you know in high speed they speed it up and then when they're done it looks like it is the coke can you know what i mean that that there are people who can do that sort of mm -hmm. photorealistic recreation of reality with their hands what i find fascinating about it is that no one did that until photography came around. There aren't examples of 18th century artists who by hand could make something look literally like a photograph, like it was perfect. But it's I almost mean, like our brains didn't of, even understand it until we had photographs that we could look at, you know? There's lots of theory that we could study or, um, you, you know, read, look at together about this. But I would just like to know I, I don't think either of us have necessarily read particularly widely on this. Why do you think we have a movement in painting called photorealism? Why is it essential that that emerged at the end of the, or the sort of later part of the 20th century? I mean, do you think, do you think that it's a cop-out? Like it's going backwards? Like we're just trying to use painting to recreate what we already have in photographs and what's the point? No, that's why I wonder about this, almost like the magic of it. Like, where does it come from? It's so obvious when we could say it comes from making photographs, but yeah. is it more than that? It's like saying that the, the color photographers that we've discussed, you know, they reference a very kind of painterly style in so many ways, a palette that is, um, again, referenced in the mid-century paintings of, in our case, when we talked about um Eggleston you know there's shades of hopper and you know we we're so comfortable and confident in fact we think ourselves so incredibly smart sometimes I think making those references back into painting but when we make references from painting back into photographs we sort of enter this treacherous territory a little bit that well I think that there's still a certain level of um I think there's still a sense that painting is higher art than photography. And so therefore, if you're making a, if you're discussing a painter and referencing a photographer or a photograph, that somehow, you know, the painter is slumming it in that case. Mm. You know? I mean, I still, I also think that there's a certain level of, I mean, this gets back to the whole Tim's Vermeer and all that stuff, where I think there's a certain belief that we want our painters to be gods that understand like seeing and just i'm going to take what i see and create it on the canvas and somehow the idea that there's any sort of mechanical or optical tools that help you do that how dare you cheat that way you know that that, that it's somehow not right to be doing that but you um, know uh is all of art a cheat of course yeah mm. in fact i think that every time that i see and this is something that i do when we're talking about all these different things I think I brought it up a few times uh, is just that like, I instantly look at stuff and go, oh, how do they do that? Like in my head, I'm automatically trying to figure it out because if it's something tricky, there's probably a trick involved. You know, if something is drastically different than what other people are doing, it's like, oh, they're using a new technique and that new technique 
well, well, not a trick in a magic sense, is a shortcut to doing what they're doing because they're doing something no one's done before. So there must be, there must be some slide that they got on and, and went down and ended up there, you know. And that slide is usually some sort of technological achievement where, yeah. you know, well, no one would ever paint a blurry person blurring through the frame of a long exposure like this before photography. Exactly. So we know that this painting has to rely on photography, you know, the, 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 the various advents of photography through 20th century, the availability of the photographic image, um, our smartphones being able to surpass many of our, you know, other, other cameras that yeah. have, it's, it's given us, I suppose, a different authority as artists to feel again, more confident or comfortable in painting to actually reference photographs. Do you think though that if, if how do you pronounce this guy's name, Bonici? Bonici, yeah. Bonici. Yeah. Uh, if, if he, if this wasn't based off a photograph, but it was based upon the kinds of things he would see in a photograph that you wouldn't see in real life, would that still be, do you see what I'm saying? That like his eyes know that this happens if you do a long exposure, like a, you know, a I don't know, this probably, if he was shaking his head and I don't know, 10th or 15th of a second, I'd say. So if you, if you, if you, if you did this and we know that this is how pictures like this look because we've all seen a million pictures like this, mm. is knowing that that's how pictures look enough to say that this is based upon photography, even if it itself was not drawn or painted based upon an actual photograph of him shaking his head? Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? I, I hope I'm making sense of it. I think what I understand from it is that, you know, can either of us imagine if possible, having never seen a photograph where there's any kind of shutter drag or slow shutter speed? And could we ever imagine seeing this without that? Is that what you're really saying, asking me? No, what, what, I, uh, what I'm saying is if he, if he has seen that, if this painting wasn't based upon a photograph, but it was based on the knowledge of how photographs work in this and dragging the shutter, Mm. Would that still, could we still say that this is based upon photography? Mm. Because in, in painting or real world, you would never think to draw this way if you hadn't seen it in a photograph that sort of smushed 15th of a second together. See what I'm getting at? I do. It's one of your amazing I, impossible questions. Isn't I don't know. I mean, because this feels like a photograph to me, even it being square, you know, could have been he held up a Polaroid and shot himself, you know. Uh, Funnily enough, you know, um, he's uh, James Bonici, he's Australian. A lot of his work, I would urge people to go and look at his work uh, on his website. His most recent work, he did quite a lot of work on things like um, mushroom clouds. It looked like there'd been some dreadful explosion somewhere. Oh, and the paint, the paint detail on that is, but it's really so incredible. But again, this idea that something that is quite simply over in a flash but that causes a delay yep. that then is painted so the delay of the action is painted and painting takes a long time and so we rely on photographs to have recorded it in the past there's a, an incredible um overlap and sense of contextual layering really when a painting is made of something such as a mushroom crowd, cloud, or even in the case of a portrait, I suppose, like this. It's a, a collision of so many uh, references, right. actually, in the kind of modern modern culture. And well, the other I, thing, I, just, to, just as an aside yeah. that um, I think is true, is I think James Bonici is a twin. And he often paints, I don't think this is his twin. Polly's not his twin. This is one, one of a series. But his brother, his twin brother, does appear in his paintings. And I found that in itself an interesting layer in paintings that look kind of like this. This idea that you have Painting someone... Painting himself, kind of. That you paint yourself who's not yourself at a speed at yep. which you don't normally see it. Yep. In a way that seems photographic, though it's painted. And in itself, of course, is a process takes a long time. And that there is something it's so splitting and so um, incredibly bizarre about that. 
I'm not even sure I could, I certainly don't think I could eloquently say what that is, but I, I certainly get the impression it's possibly a kind of important, something of importance in that. I mean, is, what's interesting about this one though is that while it obviously was using some sort of photographic techniques in order to come up with the image that he then painted, it does. this one does not feel photorealistic to me like some really photorealistic paintings are. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, although at the same time, I sometimes, I wonder sometimes if painters are envious of say photographers because a photographer could get this picture in less than a second or a painter might take eight hours to do a, a, a painting like this, right? That there's, I wonder how often a painter knows exactly where they want to end up. And it really is just, it takes time to put the, pa the, the pigment on the canvas. But I mean, there are definite codes and conventions from what I think of as also as like contemporary photographs in both these paintings. So the presence sure. of that shadow on the wall is, is so much part of like a modern language within photography. Yeah, do you see, is, is that supposed to be a shadow on her or? I find that very odd because I can't work out if, that, if there's meant to be some kind of strange finger shadow on her or I don't, I don't or, know. I don't know what that is or what that's about. A shadow, but... like, a, like a, one of those um, uh, uh, glass, um, those little glass butterflies stuck to the window or something. You know what I mean? Something yeah. like, like it's, a, it's, a, it's a hanging, um, what the hell are they called? Like a mobile? You know what um, I mean? That's yeah, like shining. I, I think so. I mean, I think in that sense, this is just a, an incredibly realistic painting in that it has been painted to show something that is so fleeting as much as a shadow can be. Yep. Uh, but that's why the shadow on the wall in that negative space is so interesting. And as is the vantage point of the painting, the painter looking at that subject from that slightly lowered position up into that top yeah, from corner. Below. That, yeah. is, that, is a, that is a photographic um, vantage point. And, and actually also, I'm sure it's, it's obvious to people looking as well, it's not what we would think of as a traditional vantage for portraiture. As a, as a photographer either even it's it's much more candid never shoot from below sandy isn't it so candid though i mean these are i these shoot are... from below all the time people yell at me about it <laughs> all right this one okay we obviously have elements of photography that are sort of taken and sort of it's almost like a a, a, a painted collage mm -hmm. you know it's like, okay, I, this is not obviously a photorealistic painting, but I'm going to take elements of photorealism, especially ones like looking through some kind of weird abstract mirror and playing with that. It's so interesting that no one painting this without looking at a photograph of that person's face would ever put that highlight on the tip of their nose. Hmm. I wonder, you know, coming back to our title, our, where is the balance? Where's the tipping point here that we know that physically, materially, this is a painting. Yeah. But is it, is it on balance? Is its driver photography? It can't, it isn't a photograph. But when do we say like, um, a good example of this would be at A level. We say to our students, um, you can be a fine artist and still be a photographer. But I wonder, you know, can a photographer be- Wait, hold on a second. You can be a fine artist and still be a photographer? Is that what you just said? Yeah, what I mean by that is, is that the- <laughs> You can be a fine artist and still be a photographer. Don't make fun of me, Bill. I'm trying to explain that it's really, uh, something that we encourage as part of a, a repertoire of a fine artist is to be a photographer. Because it's assumed that if you're a photographer, that's not fine art? I, I think yes, often. Mm, okay. So, I mean, I, I often would say I'm a photographer, I'm a fine art photographer, because also there's a movement away then from the commercial sense. That, 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 I feel like that, okay. 
quick aside, I also feel like that is all kinds of judgments on commercial photography. That commercial photography is not art. Is commercial illustration art? Do we have a, a break in the in the the seam of the universe here, where we could say that you know the difference between artists and artisans, or craftspeople and artists, which is of course a never ending argument, and yeah, lots I of think it, it quite rightly it we become very upset as working artists when they're perhaps a, a sense of diminishment in being called a craftsperson. Yeah, I, I, have, I actually had this conversation with my wife yesterday. We were talking about, well, I won't get into it, but I brought up, uh, I brought up people, you know, who were making literal sort of paper collage stuff in the arts and crafts movement in America back in the early 20th century. There are very few of those people who would be making what I considered high art. There are a few. It, to me, it's far too, um, I was gonna say lowbrow, that's not the word I'm looking for. Far too um, colloquial, you know what I mean? Far too, so I, I, I am making that distinction there. But at the same time, I'm offended by your <laughs> distinction. Just yeah. a little further along the continuum, mm -hmm. I find weird as I think of it as like, okay, I may be taking a picture for, you know, an annual report or a portrait for a magazine, but I don't do it any differently than I would if I was trying to make that photo as my own personal art. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying you're wrong that there is a distinction, but I, I, I have a very hard time defining that distinction when it comes down to it. No, but also, Bella, I'd like to just say that um, I'm in complete agreement with you. And my point about this within teaching is that the idea often is, uh, the preconceived idea is that photographs aren't fine art. Right, but is there, is there, are there photographs that really aren't fine art or are all, all photographs fine art? Well, any image. What does fine art even mean? Okay, so you know? we're going here, are we now? <laughs> I do. We don't have to. I just, I just, it, it, it does get in. I, okay. Well, back to your original. I think it's also completely relevant to what we're talking about, actually. Okay, go ahead. Where, 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 where do you, where do you think? I think any image of representation, any recording of anything in a visual format could be classed as art. That's just, that's the simple answer, isn't it? Yeah, could be anything, but if it could be, you know, if, if everyone's special, that means no one is. I mean, I agree with you. Yes, anything could be something, you know, some cardigan somebody made out of wool yarn could be high art mm -hmm. if it's some kind of exceptional cardigan. But most of the time, it's just something that keeps you warm that somebody would do while watching television. So um, where, where is the tipping point then, Bill? Because you're the one who's taken issue with what I said. Perhaps well, I, it's funny because I take issue with what you... And now we're going on the sliding scale and your cardigan reference is actually fantastic because I'd love you to tell me at what point the cardigan might become something other than the cardigan that keeps you warm. I, I don't know. But, you know, I this is, this is my obsession with Persig coming out. Uh, I'm all about finding the, the, the fault lines and things and the places where things cleave, which gets back to your original question, which we'll get back to momentarily, <laughs> of which I have an answer. Um, I know what this is about, by the way, if anybody's watching this, Bill is deliberately avoiding and delaying the other question and conversation. Well, so I come up with a good answer. A most amazing answer so that I have nowhere to go to in our discussion. Well, you figured me out. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's interesting because I don't like the idea that anything gets pigeonholed on one side or other of that line. Certainly, I don't like the idea that something is pushed to the quote unquote lower side of the line of, oh, well, that's not really art. That's just a snapshot or, or what have you. However, I, I do think that some things are just snapshots or some things are just 
you know, somebody could paint a wall red and somebody could paint a canvas red. And one thing is a color theory piece. And the other thing is my living room wall, right? So th these are, I don't know, is, is, it, just, is it intent? Is it um, uh, expertise? Is it quality, you know, uh, of the work? Um, I don't, I don't like the, the idea that there is a distinction, but I also uh, understand that I do ultimately believe that there is a distinction. I just don't know where to draw that line. And I don't like ever being found, not myself, but certain things being found on the bottom half of that dichotomy that I disagree with that judgment. It's, it's a really hard question. I mean, what I find interesting though, in your school thing is the idea that that there are some kids who are, what is that, 15 years old, 16 years old that we're talking about? A level is 17, 18. Okay, 17 year old kids, some of whom don't believe that photography is art without you telling them that it is. To me, I'm just like, of course photography could be art. Yeah, and no, but also again, just to pick up on this point, I'm not even necessarily talking about the students. I'm talking more widely about an appreciation of what they do. Sure. Yeah. And, and especially in light of the fact that, again, this is very teaching specific and teaching specific to me and in the UK or in England, you know, we work within an exam board that gives us a fine art option and also gives us a photography option within the same criteria. Okay. And at the same time also gives us a textiles version of our studies and a 3D design version and so on. So it yep. breaks down what we would think of as subject specialisms. But my point is, is that fine art still includes photography. Yep. But, but doesn't include really fabric to, art all that often. It doesn't was, include was, cooking was, or does, yeah coming towards is that when and I found this actually on my own photography degree is I spent a, a lot of time painting when I did my photography degree and I think that was weird and I think that that was considered weird whereas if I had done fine art and I'd made photographs that wouldn't have been weird because you would have made photographs for reference no, and again, this is why I know it made you bristle, but this notion of being a fine art photographer. So I have to justify myself by calling myself a fine art photographer. By the way, I love the idea that of the two of us, you're the one with the degree in photography. <laughs> I don't have anything. I'm such a loser. Go ahead. Uh, I think that's I want to be cool damned, like you. I think that's damned by faint praise, Bill. No, 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 no. I think it's amazing. I just think that it's funny that like, I actually hold a camera all the time and like I have no education and I feel like a loser when I talk to somebody who actually does. Okay, well, I mean, to, to, to belittle myself and diminish myself a little bit, which I'd rather not do, but I will to make don't. you do better. Please, no, please don't. You know, you are holding the camera and making the photographs. Are you not? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I don't do that. That's a, that's, a whole, that's a whole show right there. Yes, I know. But I, I also would like to say, in case anybody was unsure, that I do very much enjoy teaching other people about photographs and yeah. making photographs. But, but, but you, equally, you, I probably couldn't do that quite as well unless I enlisted the help of people who do actually get to hold that camera every day in a professional capacity. Right. No, I, I understand. Uh, I mean, well, if, okay. So when you look at this, is this over the line into being more about painting than it is about photography or more about photography than it is about painting? I can't call it on any of these paintings, which is why I picked them. Okay. Uh, this one would be over the line into painting for me. Like it uses elements of photography, obviously, but it is ultimately a painting that could have been done or, or has elements of painting that, that are independent of photography to a large extent. 
You're saying Bonici is, is, is the same? Mm -hmm. These feel more like impressionistic interpretations of a photograph than they do feel like images independent of the photographic source to me. I'd love it if James Bonici hunted you down. That is not, that I, I, I do not mean that as any sort of rip. Okay. No, but are you, do you understand my distinction? Mm -hmm. Do you disagree? No, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely just really interested in how you see it. Okay. I, you know, I, Plus I, you don't want Benici to hunt you down. <laughs> well. <laughs> Leave me hanging out to dry. Thanks, Sandy. <laughs> I'm just saying, I will set you up to make your point and then I yep. shall step away from the point. Yeah. But really, I think that this is, um, I, I feel happy and comfortable to say that I think this is driven by photography. Obviously, the skill set involved in it, you know, there's a mastery of paint and the materiality of paint with this work. You could not make this painting if you were just anybody. Okay. And again, I want to come back to that, listen to my language, and again, maybe you'll pick it up a little bit here as well. Could just anybody make this photograph? Yes. Mm. I mean, the painting skill is amazing. Could just and anybody if, make this photograph? I think a certain kind of people, person would see that photograph. Okay, so this again is another really good point of balance isn't it that there's a sense of tension there also between how we're reading this both as painting and as photograph and we're perhaps formulating judgments on value based on you've just said it a certain type of person would see this photograph so what type of person is that is that an informed person is that well we haven't even brought up the question of whether or not these photographs were taken by these painters Mm -hmm. But it's I just want to could have been back. taken by his friend Joe, you know. Wait, don't deflect from this. Can okay. we go into this together a little bit? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So uh, these two particularly, I think, for us talking about this, we read them as paintings. We know they're oil on canvas. Just anybody could take this photograph. This is a very kind of available photograph. Yeah, this feels like the kind of pictures uh, people take in their 20s when they're, you know, drunk with their friends. Right. But there's a distinction, isn't there, then, between this as a photograph and this as a photograph. Yes. And there's an element of our own, dare I say it, snobbery, perhaps? I think that there is... In the photograph, this could be? I think that there is... I, okay, to go back to your original thing about the the the, the trade-off or the, the handoffs between photography and painting mm. this is a painting of a photograph that's trying to look like a painting right where does it does that but each is is just a painting of a photograph so does that give this a higher value philosophically contextually no, but it does mean that when that photograph was taken, it was probably taken with more, probably, because you never know. I would say that it was probably taken with more intention than the photograph of Polly. Oh, I don't, I don't know if I can go there with the word intention. All right. But I feel I'd... like, there, I feel like there's, there was more involved in this picture. Like, I feel like this picture was set up in a way. Hmm. I don't think this was just, oh, the woman looked away and he somebody snapped a picture. Where this one could have been just Polly messing around. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I suppose, without becoming too obscure about this, what if sure. James Bonici was with Polly and he said, I want to make a painting in which you are moving? Sure. So there's the intention. So the photograph is intentioned before it's made. Yes. Would that so, change it? What is the difference then in value?
they they could be equal, but I but I still think that. Are you going back okay, on here, no, hold, hold on. Now. <laughs> well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's let's let's. Okay, let me let me pause it a different way. Okay. What if we took these two source photographs mm -hmm. and put them next to each other, and yes. one of them was by one student of yours, and one of them was by the other student of yours? You would probably look at this one as the more well done photograph. Why? Well, I mean, that, that makes the painting stage of all of this irrelevant and you're just right back to the source photograph and whether it is interesting or good or has intent or not. I don't know if it does, which is why, again, we're coming back to this idea of almost like the tension between the photograph, maybe, mm -hmm. and a painting, and also the tension between the intention and the accidental and the tension between something that is immediate and something that is very lengthy in its time. I want you to piece apart, if you can, why this is a better photographic image than this one. Uh, because I prefer photographs that look like the first one to the photographs that look like the second one. So do I, Bill, but come on. Well, I mean, look, okay, do you have an answer to this question? No, I'm asking you. I, I it, you know, ultimately I think that it comes down, do you ever read Zen and the Odin Mars Cycle Maintenance? You told me about it before, I have it upstairs, it's waiting. You bought it because of me? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is no. gonna be an interesting once you read it and, or, or if there you found a copy, because I mentioned it. Uh, it is a, the whole idea of that book is that things that are that we make writing whatever in this case photographs have quality that is independent of the viewer like they have inherent quality some things are inherently good and some things are inherently not good and some things are inherently better than others mm. and that it's somewhat independent of the viewer that they have inherent quality I would use the sort of Persig words and say, the first image has more quality than the second image. However, however, I feel like the second picture, Bonici's picture of Polly, if you had, if somebody had made that picture as sort of like a, uh, uh, like a seventies or eighties, you know, like, 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 the weird uh, Eggleston at parties thing, or even like Nan Golden, like all that sort of like 80s, like available light people partying kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You could totally see that picture mixed in with those and it would work in that time period. Um, and so when I look at it now, it's like, I, I think of it as just a snapshot, but if you were, if you put it in a period of time when photography like that was, um, uh, uh, elevated or cheered, um, it might fit in more than I do now looking at it as somebody who knows that 400 billion pictures are taken a day on these things. Mm. Um, I give it less, less quality. Um, but also we said, I like things that look like paintings. I don't like things that look like, you know, people messing around after they've had too many beers. But is that the irony of this and what actually makes it so much cleverer? Couldn't you imagine a version of this photograph painted by uh, 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 Chuck Close where it was literally photorealistic, you know, like some giant eight by eight foot painting of this? Yeah, I mean, I think it, uh, it's inevitable that we would talk about Close here in this. Um, this is very much along the feeling of a lot of the photographs that I think he painted in the 70s. I mean, yeah. Not the blur, but sort of that, that sort of, it's just a person who's there, you know. But also, I mean, I think big 70s glasses. there's lots of um, commonalities painting like this. And for example, the work of Francis Bacon. Sure. Yep. Uh, and yet we don't read Bacon's paintings as photographic. Mm, true. Uh, so again, there's lots of references to painting in this. Yes. Yes. I mean, well, I mean it, we probably, it, it, 
understand the classical references here so much more or better than maybe we do or that we've given credence to in this particular painting, but this references painting. I mean, this obviously references painting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what is interesting about the uh, Bonici painting is that the colors that he chose, even the skin colors and the color of the guy's ear are probably way more saturated than they were in that photograph. You know, like that's really red. <laughs> Unless there's something wrong with Polly, his ear did not look that red in the photograph. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, sorry, you can go to the next one. I didn't mean to slow us down. So, I mean, he's making, I think he's making interpretive choices even in recreating what is ultimately a painting of a photograph. So interpretive choice. What if we ever talked to him and he said, this actually wasn't a photograph at all. I just painted it. I'd love to know. I'd love to talk to him. In fact, I have corresponded with him. Um, he said, wait till you hear what my friend Bill says about you. <laughs> I've given him your address. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you cut you off. Go ahead. No, I mean, I, I had a, a very brief correspondence with him probably just over a year ago, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, I would like to follow that up and I would like to try and have him speak to me about his work because I do think this is so interesting and I, I want to know, I mean, he is a, a, an art graduate, so he is aware of the codes and conventions and language. Uh, he is in that position of privilege as, as I am as well, of having been educated in that context. And so I'm, I'm so interested. There's not enough information for me to be able to to say for sure about this painting yet. And I want to know more. Um, how many How many of the people, how many art, what percentage of artists that you contact do you end up in, in conversation with? I'm just interested in like, if, if, if artists generally want to talk or whether they don't want to talk for reasons of, oh, I'm too fancy or reasons of, I don't like to talk about my work. Uh, well, I think, you know, and I maybe have said on, on another, video we've done before uh i probably have about a 50 percent pass rate okay i'm i'm very persistent um but some people get annoyed by persistence i have to try and judge that and of, often i don't succeed because i think perhaps people are busy uh, i was very lucky in lockdown people had more time people i had more time but also I think other people had more time as well and they perhaps did things that they otherwise wouldn't do were we not in the middle of a pandemic and many of us stuck at home. Yep. Mm, I have found, and again, I'm sure I've said to you before that I have a very poor pass rate with um, female photographers. I've so, so wanted to talk to Victoria Stepone and it was not successful and Alicia Brodovich and also Yulia Hetta. Uh, I've contacted all of these people and I think their work is beautiful and uh, I've had no success at all. Um, I think you what's think interesting- when you talk, go ahead. No, I think what's interesting with artists is that I can take a chance and I know myself again, this, this is not for the, the YouTube stuff. This is just generally in my teaching in the past um, I've always been really interested in using uh, this kind of digital platform within a classroom setting and, you know, spent time many years ago now with Matteo Pericoli and Adrian McMurchie, actually, who you can find elsewhere on the channel. I was beaming them into the classroom, you know, a decade ago. Yeah. And I loved doing that because I felt that it gave real power and authority to what I was teaching in the classroom and the way, and the way that I was saying to you there that, you know, I'm a teacher of the thing. And sometimes students don't then see me as uh, the thing. So I, I need to use the expertise and power of people who are well known within their particular field to help me get my point across as a teacher sometimes. And I think it's really good for students to see those who work in a much more 
a purist way within a subject specialism that they might happen to be studying at school. Sure. So I love the fact that you've beamed into my classroom of photographers. I was gonna say, and, and then when you can't get the real artists, you invite me in your classroom. Well, yeah, you'll do. <laughs> Anyway, we are. Off I, 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 I think, I mean, to wrap up this little side of the thing, mm -hmm. I think that the, the fact that certain people decline has far more to do with the way they see their work and what they want to say publicly than it does anything that you are doing or not doing. Oh, I don't feel, Bill, I don't feel self-conscious about it. I would take, I would take it really personally myself. Yes, but, but we do take things kind of very personally like this. I take everything personally. Mm -hmm. I'm this this woman in the painting, she's making me nervous. Okay, we'll move on. But before we do, we haven't really given this one enough attention. Yep, no, 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 keep going. Okay, so um, I do want to say, obviously, painting references are quite obvious in this one. There's lots of um, what I would think of as uh, Northern European references, Dutch painting particularly the heavy black background even I think the, the the simple kind of physiological physiognomal kind of issues of nose and eye and browless brow all of it feeds into kind of like a memory narrative about Dutch painting Dutch portraiture mm. what do you but think about the mattering. multi the, the multi-layeredness of it all of the face mm -hmm. you know, the, the fact does that do you see that as an optical effect of the original photograph could have been taken in some sort of multi-layered mirror or do you think do you see it as it was just a shot like you or i right now and they in the painter decided to to do all of these things i do have a very strong sense of mirror a presence of a mirror yeah, me too. Um, I think we could be wrong, but I think there's something there. Yeah, I think most people would possibly see mirror. Uh, the other thing is, though, again, if you go and look at Emilio Vallalba's uh, website, he does kind of collections of paintings under the title. So the next day isn't just this painting. There's perhaps, I think, 12 paintings under this title. Um, they, they do create the illusion that you have got something wrong with you. Like as the viewer, yeah, there's something wrong with what I'm seeing. Your eyes are failing. Uh -huh. um, or I drunk so much rum that I can no longer adjust my eyes to what I'm looking at. And in many ways that I think that's why I put it next to the Bonici. There's like a kind of giddiness and a slip slidiness about it that is actually very uneasy. Um, which is why when people describe this one as having some kind of menace in it, I don't see menace at all in this. Either do I. Um, whereas with these ones, actually, I'm not so sure. I'm very uncomfortable. Yeah, in, in the wrong context or in some sort of terrible, scary dream, these would be terrifying images. Yeah, but that's this sort of shattered sense of the, of the figure form it is, of course, to do with how it is painted, but it's also then, you know, if we're coming back to the sense of the tension between something that is very realistic and not, I mean, uh, Valalba uses the kind of motif of the eye frequently as a repeat form, even in a much more abstract, overtly abstracted way as well yep. in other series of work. Um, but when I think one is able to focus on what I would think of as the smooth part of that cheek and eye and the side of the nose. There's something so disconcertingly direct about the stare, the gaze. Uh, that I, it's, it's also interesting to me, the, the, the colors that are chosen, the sort of like salmon kind of color, you know, like that there's lots of stuff done with sort of just scrapes of a knife and that kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, in, in other parts of it, where there's like this, really intense meticulousness to the face, but then some of the other elements are literally just, you know. But is, it, do you think that that is in a bid for us to be invited behind the curtain? Or do you think that that is intended as a 
do you think that that is an intended trickery in itself or do you think that that is about exploding the myth of the trickery uh good question um i think that it's they're doing it as a just a juxtaposition from what is so obviously from life and then we're going to put it next to these abstractions i think it's like the dichotomy of the two um uh, it's interesting, it's an interesting one of the things word because actually the last slide we're going to look at is agnes toth in her kind of mission statement about her work she uses the word dichotomy it's almost as if you knew by the way people watching he didn't know um nope. but of course i'm i'm trying to put images together so that we can come up on to these oh you you you, you set it up so you forced me to say it like like, a, <laughs> yeah. like 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 you're like darren brown telling me to use the word you know which constantly house. manipulating you bill yeah exactly <laughs> can i just read a quote from agnes toss sure so she says i consider it important to maintain dichotomy uh, this tension and calmness harmony and discord are simultaneously present an interesting balance um an interesting balance comes into being from which the painting pulsates so that's what she says about her work now i feel that actually we could say that uh, actually about all these paintings the one that is the most famous and possibly the best regarded is the first of all that we saw by Coves. Yeah. But that is also the furthest away, perhaps, from this statement. I, you know what's funny about this one is like, and this is this is a joke. I really don't mean this seriously. But I look at this and I say, wow, she found a really great way not to have to paint the whole thing. And it's still pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, at first I looked at this and I was thinking, is it I saw it when I initially saw it and didn't sort of really dig into how these things, how these elements connect, that it was a, a tighter image that was shattered versus seeing shattered chunks of a whole image. Does that make sense, the, the, the distinction? Because like, you know, you can see her, her, right, her right arm goes down and you can see like her thing. So, so those two pieces below her right hand are chunks of her, you know, forearm here or whatever, right? Um, where when I first saw it, I was like, oh, is this a whole thing that she just like broke apart and spread out on the canvas, which is not what it is. Mm -hmm. I'd be really interesting to find out because man, talk about, is it me or does her sense of tones and stuff feel very like YF-esque? Like look at the, like the skin tones and the face and everything. Yep, um, and also very much uh, driven by uh, the Renaissance, of course. Oh, sure, of course, yeah. Um, yeah. I, but out of all the artists we've looked at, Toth is the one who has the greatest presence in terms of having been interviewed many times and speaks very eloquently about her work. Um, and uh, she does talk about this idea of kind of uh, emergence from the painting. Uh, and I suppose viewers may oscillate between a sense that there is something that has emerged or something that is kind of reductive. So something that is either progressively coming forward into being or something yeah. that is maybe uh, quietening away somehow. How do you see it? Do you see it as, as, as taking away from the whole or, or pieces not yet whole? Oh, I don't see it as pieces not yet whole. I see it in its entirety as it is. You, but you don't. But you see it as like that there was negative tan stuff put over chunks of the painting, or do you really see it as those chunks in that tan are all part of one single field? One single field for me, I think. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, to me, it feels like you burnt parts of the painting. Like you had on paper and you let it burn. Well, again, you know, as I said, there's so much uh, people listening can go and look her up. She's got a really good website, very interesting website, very informative, but she's also spoken 
to um, lots of different interviewers for, for websites, magazines, and so on. She describes this idea that, you know, it is as if you've got pieces of paper that have been, you know, maybe not ripped, but somehow, you know, you know is there a disassembly or an assembly? Is there, sure. uh, again, a, yes, this idea of reduction or uh, coming into being, the emergence. Yeah, is it additive or just or, or subtractive? Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting. I've always wanted to do something like this photographically mm. and never had the guts to do it. That's puzzling. I don't have a, I don't have a lot of guts, Sandy. Mm. Well, you face me every Thursday, so. <sighs> yeah. It's like I have to, you know, from the minute we hang up till next Thursday, I'm trying <laughs> to like build up my confidence. <laughs> But before we finish, I do want By to- By the way, I like, the, uh, this is my favorite of the bunch. Okay. So I think for, um, again, lots of my students, when I show work like this, uh, this has got, uh, this, is a, this is a big hitter with many of my A-level students. People really like this painting. I can imagine that. Um, I think because it's, it's, it's very good looking. Yeah. And yeah. I don't think it's disturbing in the way that perhaps that's disturbing. True. Uh, or indeed that's disturbing. And even to some extent, it's not disturbing in the way this could be disturbing. So much as you and I are saying that this doesn't have a sense of menace for either of us, if I stayed with this long enough, um, and of course in other paintings I've mentioned of his where we've got a wider sort of interior scene, there is a, a, a more kind of Crudson-esque sense of uh, this joint somehow discord this one but, you, but you, you think you don't think that toss stuff could be creepy and disconcerting in like a destructive kind of way I do like, because, like my life is just kind of floating you know fluttering away yeah well there is that sense and she's talking about it in the quote I read out this idea yeah. that there is a discord we aren't met with what we want entirely yeah you know a, a viewer um a viewer is often, you know, a viewer is often very greedy for the visual information, and she's not giving us what we may think of as all of that. But I think when I view this painting, uh, and especially now, this is very familiar to me, and I've used it for a long time as a reference uh, with students. I would say that it. I do see this as its entirety. I don't expect something else from it. And though, again, she herself describes the sense that you may well fill in the gaps or at least seek to fill in the gaps, that doesn't have to necessarily be the, the, the function of the painting, that it stands, it can also stand alone just as it is. Do you have any idea of how large this one is? This is quite a big painting, I think. Like life size or bigger? Life, life size, I think. Um, whereas uh, that's quite small. You can almost tell by the amount of detail. Yeah. I'm not sure how big that one is. By the way, Emilio Valalba is, his website, go and have a look at it. There's kind of tutorials on there as well. Uh, I American, I think he lives in San Francisco. Very, a, a real sense of generosity on his website of sharing his techniques. Um which would be interesting for anyone who's watching who is currently studying painting. Uh, anyway, Bill, the tension, the balance between painting and photography, is that balance tipping now where we've come so far into photography from painting that we go back into painting from photography and that now the two will forevermore interweave, interlock and be present within each other? I've always found painting more interesting than photography. I just can't paint. That's the only reason I'm a photographer. So, <laughs> but if I could, I would make stuff like this. Um, then I think everybody would join me in saying, go on then, go and make your photographs like this. Yeah, I will. 
when I get my new camera in six months. Bill Wardman, it's been a pleasure. Sandy, as always, I hope, I hope people can be, you know, uh, can hang on for two more weeks before our next one. I'm not sure how they will cope. I, it's like waiting for a COVID vaccine. Bye, Bill. <laughs> Bye, Sandy. <laughs>